All right. Hey, everybody. Thank you for tuning back into our channel. We are here today with Harry Oaks. Um, he he has a um, what is search and rescue dogs. He works. For, uh, uh, now I'm getting off. <laughs> Look, you're making me <laughs> you're making me nervous, Harry. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but we just wanted to bring Harry on here and let him explain what he does and, you know, what he did for the searches that involved um, Kyron and other people. So, Harry, can you explain kind of what you do, what your dogs do, um, well, the I'm different types of... Okay, I'm in charge of a professional private canine search and rescue team for over 25 years, I volunteered and coordinated search and rescue through the sheriff's office in Oregon and Washington. And then after I ended up testifying against the sheriff in uh, Klamath County and the Oregon legislature, after they killed two children for not using search dogs, um, I kind of got blackballed uh, because I was not one of the good old boys to get my mouth shut. Uh -huh. uh, after Derek, they cost, the, in my professional opinion, cost the life of Derek Ingebrigtsen and Nathan Matson in Klamath County. Anyway, I did I did what I was felt was right, which was I testified and told the truth. Um, yeah. My opinion that we could have saved both of those kids' lives had we been called the first 24 hours. And as it was, we ended up determining what happened to both of them. They both died within the search area. Uh, one fell through a frozen pond and died uh, after spending the night up on the mountain. And another one... Uh, laid on the horse blanket or saddle and put the horse blanket on top of them, waited for help that never came. And after they put over 2000 ground searchers in there in nine months, they couldn't find anything. Uh, state police finally gave my name to the family. They called us in and we were able to, our team was able to determine what happened to Nathan and state police are doc, have documented um, one of my team members uh, finding his, the boy's remains uh, in the search area that I coordinated the search. Anyway, the long story short, I went private um, to coordinate search and rescue privately on behalf of uh, family members. And we still work with law enforcement if they request us to come in. And certain agencies still use it today, mainly the state police. Uh, I worked for the government, uh, Department of Defense, uh, doing private contracts for Americans missing overseas. I've traveled the world twice uh, in doing search and rescue around the world. I've done over 14,600 uh, calls. Uh, that doesn't mean I've physically worked all of those calls, but I've received that many for missing people. And we do pets as well. Um, to me, pets are just as important as people. And yeah, horses, yeah. we do horses, log, birds, dogs, oh, cats. Wow. Yeah, it, it, we've done a little everything. Anyway. For, so in the case, I don't want to interrupt, but in the first case you were talking about, if they would have called you in um, yeah. in the first place, you, you would have found the boys. It's my professional opinion because we had no trouble tracking uh, yeah. either one of them. And we had the family with us witnessing our track. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and in the Derek Ingebrigtsen case, we found where he climbed up the south end or the north end of Pelican Butte spent the night underneath a log. He had a little hatchet with him and he, he could see where he'd been chopping on the underneath. Of the oh my log. God. And then the next day he climbed on down the other side and then fell through the marsh and his body's never been recovered. We had divers go in there, but that marsh is so nasty and silty that you can't see anything. That is horrible. Yeah, it is. And I've been down there three times with the search dog and they still indicate bodies in there or the remains, I should say, but there's a lot of predatory animals down there that could have consumed the body, not including the, the, the clay sediment could have pancaked them down underneath the water, in, in the water. But the bottom line is, same with the Nathan if Nathan case, if we'd been allowed in there the first day, I think we could have saved that boy's life. Uh, but for, for many years, the National Missing Children's Office in Portland, Oregon, contacted me and I was the go-to guy to find missing children. Uh, and I donated my time. I didn't charge anybody any money. Oh, that's yeah. amazing. That's and awesome you did that. I was a former police officer for 12 years. And between that and the many years of doing search and rescue, total now 50 years, uh, 
combined with the 36 years of the search dogs, I know how to use the search dogs to find missing people. And mm -hmm. so we get the tips of where the kids last were. Um, and I've had kids change their disguise to where I didn't even recognize them. But the dog, you can't change your scent. Yeah. So I've, I've had the dog go right up to a person that I was looking for, like a young little 12-year-old girl that was missing out of Oregon City, was told I was told that she was missing down in, near the, the skate park uh, Nordstrom's, uh, across from Nordstrom's at Pioneer Courthouse Square. I went down there. And my dog kept alerting on this child that was to be 16 years old, wasn't, didn't have the same hair color, same clothing, nothing, but the dog kept alerting on her. Oh, my and gosh. I, and I just said, listen, are you so-and-so? I'm with the National Missing Children's Office, and I just want to talk to you. And she started to run. I said, if you run, I've got two police officers sitting right over there at Nordstrom's. I just give them the signal. They're going to tackle you in front of everybody here. Yeah. You're embarrassing for you. And she's okay, I'll talk to you. And it turned out it was the girl you know, that we were looking for, but the dog is the one who identified her. She, I was oh looking for a God. five foot one blonde, blue eyed girl wearing jeans and a, a sweatshirt. And I was, I had a girl with bright <laughs> red hair, spiked, a nose ring, uh, wearing a sweater, a skirt, uh, and stood about five, six. She had platform shoes on. Oh, and, wow. Yeah. You know, didn't even look like the, the picture that her mother gave me. But again, oh. the dog identified her. So that, again, that's where the dog comes in handy. Uh, what what kind of scent articles do you usually use? Like, is it I like, like use shoes, uh, bed sheets, pillowcases, uh, clothing, like hats, stuff that the individual's worn that hasn't been washed. Mm -hmm. uh, anything, anything that will identify that one person to the search dog. But anyway, when the Cameron Harmon case came in, well, let's get back. Let's go back to the Ward Weaver case in 2002. Yeah, I was amazed that you were like, I've heard of that. I heard that story, the case before, and I didn't even know you were, you know, the one that found the girls. And I was so amazed, like, oh, well, my gosh, you know. OK, so for all, all these years that I've been looking for missing children, uh, when Ashley Pond first disappeared on January, in January 2002, a lot of people contacted me and said, we want you in on this case. Well, I can't just invite myself in. I have to be invited in either by the police or by the family. The um, family wanted me in there, and I said, well, we have, you know, I can't interfere with their investigation just like they can't interfere with my investigation. If I'm under contract, it's illegal for them to, to interfere with it. And so we have a mutual respect with each other that, you know, they're doing their own search. I leave it be, and if I'm doing my search, they leave me be. And I know what laws, you know, I have to obey the laws just like everybody else. And I can't trespass on private property without the owner's consent and stuff like that. So anyway, we just sat back. I called Oregon City PD and said, do you want me in on this? And they said, no, we've got our own dog team. So like, okay, fine. So at January 25th, uh, when they did their search for Ashley, up until February, they had searched Ward's property many, many times as well as the surrounding areas with the Oregon search dog teams, as well as the federal FBI teams and stuff like that, and dog teams. And they mm. didn't find anything. Then Miranda disappeared uh, February 26th. That was the same friend that was on the news that one time, right? Uh, like that. Right. Okay. Ward had a daughter that was the same age as this young lady. And the you know, girl had been hanging out with Ward and his family, the, bo the boys and the daughter. Anyway, um, again, I asked Oregon City PD, do you want me to come in? They're like, no, we've got our own dogs. And it's like, okay, fine. So come March 20th, and they still, they went public and said, they have searched Ward's property seven different times, couldn't find anything. So the aunt hired us, uh, or no, excuse me, Ashley's mom hired us. Uh, she paid me one dollar under contract fee, so legally we were under contract. And <laughs> oh wow, she didn't have any money, so you know one dollar is not going to break anybody. And yet, yet legally under the law, it's, it's a contract. Mm -hmm. So we went myself and another dog hound named Michelle, eating with her dog Yogi and me with my dog Valerie. Uh, went in there and I contacted Ward. Said, "Do you mind if we go on your property?" He's like, "Hey, everybody else has been on our property. I don't care." So uh, we looked around, and I immediately got a death alert inside 
um, Ward's house in the in the hallway, which showed me that Ashley had been killed right there. Uh, now oh I specialize God. in forensic sent evidence. I, I have solved numerous cases in kidnappings and homicide cases in Clark County, Vancouver, Washington, for the Clark County Sheriff's Office, as well as Kamini County and Polk County, Oregon. So I have a long, credible history uh, with these agencies. Anyway, the bottom line is uh, the dogs alerted in the in the hallway. Then they we went outside, looked around where the cement. Ward had a cement slab that was located behind his house, mm -hmm. and where the cement and the ground came together, my dogs, my dog, and then uh, Michelle Keating's dog Yogi both alerted at that location, and that told me that there was a body underneath the concrete. Because what was happening is that as the sun would hit the concrete, it would expand the concrete and heat up everything underneath and that would form the body gases to come out between the, the grass and the, where the concrete met. Oh, but wow. A mental note of that. Ward had a lay down freezer in his kitchen and I tried to open it and I'll tell you what, his son's face turned about five shades of white when I tried to open that and it was big enough to hold a human body and it was locked and I kept saying, do you have a key? And he was really nervous, like, no, no, we don't have a key. Yet my dog kept alerting at that freezer and so I just played ignorant and said, okay, fine. And then we continued our search and there was a small shed behind Ward's house. And I, my mm -hmm. dog alerted there as well. And I opened it up and there was five no pest strips that kill flies. Now who was gonna have five no pest strips loaded with dead flies in a shed? Unless there's a yeah. body, what's gonna attract those flies? Now the FBI missed all of this. How did they miss it? And how did your dogs and how did you? Because they're idiots. Like, yeah, I mean, and, and why <laughs> why do people you know, why do people people deny your help? Like, isn't it best for everybody to be involved in this kind of case? Like, why not bring Harry Oaks? You know? Because it's political. When I testified against the Climate County Sheriff, I was told, quote unquote, by the Oregon State Sheriff's Association. We will never. We will make sure that you never get used again, because you won't, you know, cooperate with us. Most like I'm going to cover up two homicide cases, in my opinion, because uh, I won't keep my mouth shut. And, and I said, if you want, you're like me. Way. So anyway, the Oregon, the Oregon, Department, <laughs> the Oregon Department of Justice came in and did this big old audit on me, and, and because I was no longer a game player, they they asked the sheriff to shut me down. I mean, the or DOJ to shut me down. And the DOJ came in and uh, IRS audited me for three years. The DOJ audited every single search I ever did from 1972 on. And oh, they, wow. And they came back and said, my record keeping was the best they'd ever seen. And there was no foul play. There was no wrongdoing on my part. There was no wrong, no action, no illegal action on my part. And that they were the ones that actually suggested I go into from a nonprofit to a for-profit private contractor so that the sheriff couldn't interfere with me. So oh, okay. I the, uh, the nonprofit world uh, canine team into a for-profit contracting business. And um, like I said, that's what 14,000 some odd cases ago. Anyway, the bottom line is we're successful. Otherwise, if we weren't successful, I'd have no business. Plain and simple. Yeah. When, yeah. when, um, when we told on March 20th, I wrote a report and I asked Oregon C. I actually called 911 and asked Oregon CDPD to come in with a search warrant and find the, recover the body in the shed and dig up the slab. And they said, we're watching Ward. We want you to back off and let us watch him. It's their case. There's nothing I can do about it. So I sent a copy of my report to the FBI, went to Oregon City PD. And one to each of the family members, uh, Ashley's mom and Miranda's mom, so that mm -hmm. they knew where the bodies were and that we had found them. That validated everything. On August 20th, they had still not done anything, and I was livid uh, because that's five months. And I finally contacted the senator, and I won't give out his name, but I, get, I contacted the senator. And I said, listen, you either make them FBI go in and dig up this slab and open up that shed and get the bodies out of there, or I'm going to go back there with a well, I'm at week newspaper and a photographer, and I'm going to do it. And it can be very embarrassing for law enforcement if I do it. He yeah. Said, 
go ahead and back off. I'll handle it. Two days or three days later, they were in there with their ground penetrating radar going, oh, look what we found. Well, of course, you know, they recovered both bodies. They refused to give me any credit, even though it says in my report on the date where we found them and who found them. And the family gives us credit. Um, MB, MSNBC, Dateline and did a story called Into Thin Air and, did, and validated that. What we, they showed my report. They showed that they talked to the mothers. And the, even Ward Weaver, in a second, leave that alone. Um, Ward Weaver, in his confession, even said Harry Oaks was 100% right. I mean, what, what oh more do you want? Oh, my gosh. Really? Yeah. So, we highly recommended uh, Harry Oaks. Anyway, this is <laughs> This embarrassed the FBI, and it's, it would. It turned out it was not the agents themselves. They believed me. It was the administration knew about the politics between me and the sheriff's office, wow. and they they refused to listen to me. And that's what happened. So when Kyron disappeared, everybody said, "Oh, contact Harry because he knows what he's doing." Well, again, I can't interfere with law enforcement case, and this was the case with Multnomah County Sheriff's Office, and that's the first agency I first started with as a cadet and reserve back in the seventies. And so I totally respect who Multnomah County is and what they do. And I just kept, kept quiet and watched what they were doing. So when um, they couldn't find uh, this young man, uh, Kyron, then I kept, I had, must have had 25 people daily emailing me saying, and calling me saying, we want you in on this. I'm like, I can't just walk in on this. I have to. Was it, it was just like people, random people, or was it family? No, no family. Well, what, eventually one of his aunt is the one who brought me in privately, Aww. but his mom refused to, because her husband works down in Klamath County, Jefferson County in that area. And the one that he testified. Testified against. So he's, he's a police officer. He's a detective down there, and they they didn't want anything to quote, do with me because I'm not one of the good old boys. Uh, like, well, you know, it's your child. You, it's your choice. Um, I just find that so wrong in so many ways, well, and you, you know, I, you and I both have to agree to, you know, that's just our opinions. And you know, if I was if my child was missing, I don't care who found the child. Plain and simple, but yeah, I mean, you would you would want all the help you could get. And um, didn't you do some searching though on your own of what you could have? You well, could once the aunt invited me in. We brought in uh, three. Search was it the aunt from Kane's side? I'm sorry, I'm interrupting again. Was it? Um, no, it was uh, on uh, the the wife's side. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, uh, Terry's side. On. Uh, no, the Desiree. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. 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 An aunt that brought us in. And anyway, uh, we, let's see, uh, Kane refused to allow us on his property. He said, we've already had search dogs. Now, remember, these are the same search dogs that the county used and the Ashley Quantum Rana case that they didn't find crap. Okay. Yeah. So I have no confidence in those guys. They've already. Oh proved my me. gosh! So it was the same exact ones that yeah, did. And, uh, they've already proved to me on many, many cases they can't find crap. Now some of them do a good job. Don't get me wrong, but in this case, mm -hmm. as we all know, and there may not be anything to find. But here's the, let me explain what we did find. So when we worked the perimeters of Kane's property. Mm -hmm. uh, all three dogs who are, have found numerous, documented numerous bodies, kept alerting towards Kane's property. And this is broad daylight. And the, uh, I lost visual on you, Lexi. I don't know if that's important. Oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So anyway, the, uh, a volunteer that was tagging along with us, uh, took a picture in broad daylight of where the dogs kept staring. And we have an image of a human spirit in the tree staring back at us. I saw that picture. Yeah, you said I, it was... I posted it publicly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we deal with dead bodies almost every week. So it, to me to see a spirit or the dog, it does, you know, it's just part of what we do. Um, yeah. The American Indians believe that dogs can see spirits. Uh, I've watched my dog talk to dead people before. Uh, every time we go into a drowning 
my old dog Willow would go and start a funny little bark and stare and wag her tail. And it's brownie, so it's very interesting. And she's the only dog that's ever done that. But bottom line is, uh, in this case, all three dogs alerted repeatedly. We did the search three different times. They kept alerting the same spot on Kane's property. And you and couldn't, that was, so you were outside the property and you could not go. Men's can carry the scent and they carry the scent right to the dogs. We did find a cult worshiping pentagram uh, for the, uh, the occult, you know, like devil worshiping. Oh, uh, wow. We could see it on the front of the property uh, line. Uh, so I don't know if that is related to this case, like they used for a human sacrifice. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Um, we don't have his scent article, so I can't tell you that that was uh, Chiron's body that the dogs are alerting on. One speculation was that the Terry was alleged to have hired a Hispanic person doing landscaping to kill Cain. Uh -huh. That's an allegation. And right during all of this, his family disappeared. It's alleged that the Hispanic family uh, uh, the Hispanic uh, gardener, his, yeah. family, his, his wife and kids disappeared. Now, we don't know if that's, I don't know if that's true or not, but I've heard that story many times. And we don't know if it's their bodies that the dogs are alerting on or if it's Kyron's body. But somebody's on, on or near that property giving the dogs, the dogs don't know how to lie. And all three yeah. dogs are doing the same thing. And these are all trained dogs. They've all found bodies before. So there's no excuse, no reason for them not to. And they're not going to hit on a dead animal. So uh, during this, like, do you, I mean, couldn't it, even though Tony felt some type of way towards you because the whole testify situation, like, was Cain, like, refusing as well? Like, he was he not, like, you know. He, he says, I'm only allowing state certified search dogs on my property, which is this Oregon search box. Even though we are, our standards to supersede and exceed the state certification, we want nothing to do with their, their certification. And we use our international standards. They, they've been very successful all these, all these years. And uh, anyway, the bottom line is his property. There's not, not much more we can do about it. It's very interesting that right after Kyron disappeared, Kane immediately put up no trespassing signs, put up security cameras and got a dog to warn him of, you know, people coming in and around near his property. So he's got to be nervous about something. Yeah. And, and, and his son's missing. You know, that would make me nervous. But it also could be that he's trying to cover up something. I don't know. Did you get any kind of, um, like, weird vibes from any of them? Like, were they trying to seem like they were covering? I mean. Well, what do you think? Um when a, a family member says, my son's missing, I want everybody's help, but I don't want your help, even though you, you've got a long history of finding people, I don't want your help. What do you, yeah, yeah, it raises some huge red flags. Yeah, it says a lot. It definitely says a lot. And I've seen, you know, I, I've been researching you, and I'm like, if my child went missing, and, you know, I, I would definitely want Harry to be <laughs> to be the one to look. I mean, some people what, were hurt. I haven't, you know, I haven't found every single person, but I've certainly have got an extremely high recovery rate. Yeah. And how many people have you, um, can I'd you have, give us? I'd have to research that. Let me, let me pull up my. I know I have it written down, but I have so many screenshots in my phone. It would take me like days to just. Hang on look. for a second. I'll pull up my file here. Uh, let's see. Okay, in uh, 36 years, I've handled 14,640 search calls, uh, 10,578 for persons and lost pets. The rest has been for evidence. Oh, my God. And 302 cases, they were canceled because the person or a pet was found by somebody else before we got there. Mm -hmm. I documented finding 1,359 people and pets and oh, wow. 3,331 uh, evidence finds, a uh, total of 
fines would be four thousand six hundred ninety nine for evidence and people and, and pets. For forty three homicides, ten kidnappings, one hundred twenty five drownings, three bombing terrorist attacks, twenty earthquakes, disasters, six floods, eight mudslides, two tornadoes, four hurricanes, five major wildland forest fires, and one hundred thirty one suicides. That is amazing, Harry. Uh, that is. Documented. It's all been validated, verified by sec, you know, law enforcement officials as well as second party officials, uh, family members, other searchers. So that is good. amazing. I really think that, I mean, I, you probably think the same. Like, if you were able to search for Kyron, like you could have, you, you probably <sighs> well, would have. Yeah, we, who knows? I mean, I, there's so many speculations. I have one person that contacts me from Las Vegas who claims that he's down there with Kane's brother. Oh, yeah, I know who that is. <laughs> and um, I keep asking her for photographs of the, the picture of his, of the boy and his ear. I got to see a picture of his ear because you can change the face, but you can't change the ear. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. she finally did supply me with the ear photograph, and it's is the ear's not the same. The face, I'll tell you what though, if you do age regeneration, um, the face certainly is similar. But yeah, she, I've I've seen that picture too, and I I see the resemblance in the face, oh, yeah. but but then she brought up the skeleton boys as well. Yeah. Um, and I was like, okay, wait, Kyron and the skeleton boys were together, so it kind of. But I was like, did you tell Harry about this? You know, because yeah, I know yeah. that you, you said something about the ears before. Yeah, we, we can match the ears with the security cameras at bus stations, train stations, airports, and all that other That's stuff. That's awesome. Um, the, and I've sent that forward to the National Missing Children's Center in, in Virginia. I've also mm -hmm. sent it on to the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office and to the FBI, and I haven't heard back from them. So I, you know, they're not, they're not talking. Um, as, and I, I don't want to comp compromise their investigation in any way, shape, or form. That yeah. the reasons for not speaking, and you know, I have to respect that. Uh, Can this, you tell us about anything that was found? I don't know if it was found by you, but was there no, like a there was a, there was a pair of glass reading glasses? We had a bunch of women that volunteered their time to come along with us. And, oh, okay. Uh, they, I asked them to search specific areas while we were busy searching around the Ward Weaver, or not Ward Weaver, um, Kane's property around the perimeter. Mm -hmm. And they called me and said that they found a the boys' glasses, mm -hmm. and they photographed it and turned it over to the sheriff. I never did see him; I just saw the picture. And I must say, they same color, same texture, everything. It looks like they're his, but again, I don't know. Yeah. Um, the that was found on a uh, logging road just to just a few miles past Skyline School, and oh, then wow. a, um, a large cooler with fresh duct tape around it uh, found with human hair. I was told there was human hair inside. Uh, that was turned over to the sheriff's office, and then later on that year, I was out. Uh, asked to go check out an area near the Grange um, east of there. And I did that and found a bone that appeared to be belonging to a human. And it was not brought there by coyote because when a coyote chews on a human's remains, you see little teeth marks on the bone. This was mm -hmm. put there by a bird of prey. You can see the it had been stripped by a bird of prey by a beak. Um, I photographed it. I took it over to Sunnyside Hospital or to Longview, excuse me, Longview Hospital, and talked to orthopedics doctor and showed it to him and said, "Is this human or animal?" Because I wasn't sure. I, you know, I'm a former emergency medical technician of 20 years. I know what bones look like, but again, there's some human and animal bones that are look pretty, you know, a lot of light. And the, yeah. doctor, the doctor said that's human. Like, oh my gosh! So I turned that over to the medical examiner's office in there in Clackamas County. Uh, that Christmas Eve, and again, if that was his, they're not talking because they can open it up, do DNA on the bone marrow, and determine whether that's him or not. And nobody said any. So, how long yeah. ago was that? And I have, at, on occasion, we found a, a a dead child in Hood River, 
many years ago. Just I was out with a friend. We were out photographing wildlife. My dog mm-hmm. went over to this tree and started digging. And we found uh, where somebody had buried a, a, a very little child, an infant. And, oh, my gosh. And it's not uncommon uh, for certain societies when the child dies for them to just go and bury it because they don't want attention brought to themselves, uh, whether they be illegals here in this country or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, it, it, you know, we that happens once in a while. So I don't know what the situation was, where this, how this bone got, you know, became exposed to the elements and then bird of prey got it from there. Searched the heck out of that whole area of Mountaindale and, and didn't find anything else. So it, it, it wasn't just part of the skeletal remains. It was the only remains that were put there by a bird of prey. So that's the only thing I found so far. Um, again, we've searched a lot of area. We did get a search down in Salvi's Island area. Mm-hmm. And the body was recovered, but that was an adult that fell off the sailboat there in the channel. Mm-hmm. Um, when the dogs alerted, the river patrol came in and recovered a body there. Uh, other than that, that's what we have. In your personal opinion, do you believe Kyron is still out there? I mean, do you, since he hasn't been found, like nobody's. You know, as a parent, grandparent, I'd like to say, you know, if this was my child, I'd like, you got to believe that since he hasn't been found, yeah, he's out there somewhere. Was he sold for drugs in Mexico, you know, and the child prostitution, child yeah. stuff? Uh, that's a possibility. Was he killed for uh, cult worshiping issues? Yeah, because he found uh, that cult. That yeah, that, cult was kind of, was a, that was a strange. What did they say about that when you found it? I mean, did you nobody show? Talked, nobody's talking. Nobody had talked to us. We just turn photographs and everything over to the sheriff's office, and you know they're not saying anything. And again, it's their case. Um, so we haven't found. I have not found his body. So until we do, I can't say he's dead. Yeah. Um, so I have to assume that he's either dead by some, you know, somebody's wrongdoing, or he's very much alive and in hiding. Yeah. Um, also, because you have experience, I mean, you were a police officer as well. Do do detectives, do police, do they usually give family, like, information, like, you know, um, like DNA evidence, I, like if they found blood DNA or if they... They, they will hold the investigation close to their their chest, meaning that they will keep quiet on until they're ready to proceed with a prosecution if they suspect that a family member is involved. And in this case, uh, they may suspect uh, Terry Foreman, they may suspect Kane, they may suspect somebody else, Desiree. Uh, I I don't suspect Desiree in any way, shape, or form of uh, foul play here, but they may, there's a Dee Dee Spicer was involved in this, and you know, so there's a, there's just we don't know if she's involved in the disappearance of Kyron. Um, you know, there's a lot of information that has not been shared because it is a criminal investigation. So yeah, I, I, I can just tell you what I've been told and what I've read. And spec- yeah, it's a lot of speculation. It's like a lot of hearsay. T- me and I feel like it does more like hurts the case more than anything by spreading yeah. all this stuff that you don't even know you know well, um, yeah, somebody came forward and said that they thought they saw Terry put Karen in a duffel bag and dump him in the river in Saudi Island I mean if that's true then why didn't we learn about this 12 years ago we could have found him with the search dog easy if that had been the case exactly uh, but again this is all information that is 12 years old uh, I have no idea what's true, what's not true. I was getting calls from psychics from all over the world going, check this and check that. And for three years, we went out and we checked different things. And finally, one day, somebody from Seattle came down at three o'clock in the morning and said, I need you over here to check this. There's 
there's a body right here. And we went, there's a, there was a ground squirrel. <laughs> I'm curious. And this lady's screaming, crying, and screaming, there's a body here. And my daughters are looking at me like, no, they're not. Oh and my I, God. Okay. I'm done. Yeah. You know? I bet you've gotten so many crazy, crazy oh, yeah. calls. And we, we, we've asked Desiree for a scent article. I've asked Kane for a scent article. They refuse to give us something to help them find their child. So I'm pretty much. Do, do parents usually do that in cases like no. this? I mean, what? This is the first family who's not ever cooperated in, in wanting somebody to get in there and find their child. I just don't understand. And nobody else can. I mean, the aunt, she wanted your help. Couldn't yeah. she just put something and give it to you? Like. She doesn't want. She wants her to be involved, but not directly. Yeah, and again, it's their family. I, I'm not gonna. I've got it. Yeah, you can't. I mean, you can't do anything. You can't I make anyone. I average about 250 to 450 calls a year, and you know, if they don't want my help, there's a lot of other people out there that do. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm done with this case unless somebody comes forward to me and convinces me there's some specific evidence that we can help law enforcement find. So you're just, you don't think that um, you like just going out there. I mean, you've done it already. Like right. nothing will change. There's there, no point. There. So unless somebody comes forward with some very factual information that convinces me to go look, I'm not going to waste my time. Especially um, since the family's treated this the way they have. Yeah, I don't, I don't understand. It, it feels like people are hiding something and I just, I don't get yeah. it. It's just. Yeah, you know, it makes you scratch your head and think, okay, well, politics. Like Politics is one thing, but when you're dealing with a child's life, politics should go out the door. Yeah, it definitely should. I mean, I, I find that so weird that they refused your help because you testified in something that, I mean, you told the truth. Okay. You're doing the right thing. So I, yeah. you would think that would go out, you know, that Tony would say, okay, you know what? That's, that's another issue. We have to find Kyron. Let's hire him. Who cares what he testified in? Yeah. I, I just don't get it. I don't. I don't understand. Um, well, it's sad. It's a sad situation, and I wanted people to hear it from you because there's just so much, so much stuff like that was said. I don't even want to say any of it, but I wanted you to, you know, so you yeah. weren't paid for anything. You weren't now, at the at the la tail end of all these psychics calling me. Mm -hmm. I finally put my foot down. So listen. I've spent all my time and money doing this on my own. If you want me to go check a certain area, then you pay for my gas. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, no. And for the last two or three searches I did for Kyron, they, they paid for my gas. Otherwise, I wouldn't go out and do it. <laughs> I remember I contacted you about that. How? Oh, well, we've got hundreds of calls coming in. So. Um, how many? I have a couple questions before. Um, I think you said you had to do something today. I don't want to keep you longer than I don't know if you are busy or. Um, how many dogs do you usually take with you? And then what do you have to do to get ready for a search? Well, when a person calls me and says they need our assistance, we send them a, a private service contract. It spells out what we can and can't do, how much we charge. To explain mm -hmm. in detail that we can't trespass on private property without the owner's consent, and that way they know what we can and can't do. There's like they can't come back and say, "Well, you didn't say that." So it's right there in the contract. And mm -hmm. people, if they want our assistance, they fill it out. We tell them exactly what we're going to charge. I charge twenty-five dollars an hour travel time each way. I charge for the cost of fuel, meals. If I have to spend a night in a hotel, then I charge for that, and I charge two hundred dollars an hour for the search. Now, if it's a missing child, depending on how far I've got to travel and where I often will donate my time on a child. Same with an, uh, in disasters. We've never charged. We've been over to, to 29 different disasters around the world. We've never charged a nickel for any of that. We pay our own way. Just Aww. like the earthquake, the, the airline's ticket just for the Turkey earthquake was $1,600 per dog animal. And we pay that out of our own pocket. And that's oh my God. Plus, take time off work and you know go and try to help these people. But anyway, when a person calls and says, "I, I need your help," they sign a contract, and uh, once they make the deposit, we'll set up a column and set up a time. We'll go in there. We'll get something that has the person or the pet's scent on it. 
you can't track the person or the pet, and, and that's that. Um, then after we're done, we have the, the family go with us so that they can see what we're doing. We mm -hmm. point out what we find, what we don't find. Sometimes it's not pretty. You know, mm -hmm. when, we, when we found a young man that had died in Classic County, it had been missing for almost a year, and uh, he had hung himself from a tree. And then the mm -hmm. mom was right there to see. It was not a pr pretty sight. Oh, and, I can uh, imagine. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, some of these cases are are pretty sad. And the same thing, like when we go to a drowning, you know, a lot of times the dogs will pinpoint where the body's at, and it's not a pretty sight. Um, what What do you do when um, they pinpoint, like? when someone drowns like is that when somebody will have to come in and go um... we'll go in there but if we can get a boat we'll go in there and pinpoint where the body's at because the body gas is slow to the surface and the dog will show us exactly where the remains are and we'll mark that location they have the dive team come in uh or in the sheriff's office come in and, and recover the body because that's their job not mine uh, yeah you know in a disaster i'll help recover bodies but at any other time no i uh, let the sheriff's office do that okay um so and also how do you do you train the dogs or i've trained dogs and handlers for many many years we're going on 36 years now and we we use all breeds of dogs anything from a wiener dog up to a great dane and everything in between oh the really smaller, oh yeah the smaller dogs are great for confined space rescue they, that they, is awesome. You know, they can crawl in the spots where the big dogs can't. And trying to load a wiener dog in a helicopter is a whole lot different than a 160 pound great day. Yeah. So, <laughs> but, uh, you know, obviously, you have to be careful what kind of dog you use. Like a, a wiener dog out in the wilderness is not a good thing because it's <laughs> their food. They hawk, yeah. Cows, cows, go, oh, yeah, thank you. I'll eat that for mm -hmm. lunch. Uh, <laughs> So, you know, medium size to a larger size dog. We have a lot of golden retrievers on the team. We have shepherds, German shepherds. I, all of my dogs have been rescued. So I get them from the dog pound. My first one was a black lab. The second one was a lab Newfoundland mix named Ranger. Third one was a little mutt named uh, Valerie. She was an Aussie Kelpie mix. Uh, the mm -hmm. third or the fourth one was uh, see, Willow. She was a purebred border collie. The next one was Tyler. He was a, a short-haired border collie, and then oh. I've got now I've got Miss Cindy Lou. She's a little Aussie that was rescued out of a pig farm in Lapine, Oregon, and she's three and a half years old and done over 350 cases. And I've also got one just started training with me. He's a short-haired border collie named uh, Max, and he's my backup dog in case something happens to Cindy Lou, and he's a year old. <laughs> So, so how, do you, how do you train them? Like I, I, I we start with obedience and agility because the dog has to, you know, be obedient and work uh, under our direction. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we train them for agility because they do have to climb up ladders sometimes or crawl through tunnels to reach people, and they have to climb over obstacles, logs, and stuff like that. Then from there we start hiding people. We'll we'll take a live person and have them. We'll hold the like we'll say, go up to a playground and identify ourselves to the parents and say, listen, this dog's in training. Can Would your child like to run and go hide, play hide and seek with the dog? And a lot of times we're like, sure. So we'll let, introduce the dog to the child and say, hey, this is this is uh, Ray Ray. And say, Ray, this is uh, Max. You know, and, and Max will give Ray a kiss and kiss him and, and whatever. Aww. And then they, they hide to each other. And then I'll let Max watch Ray Ray go hide behind a tree. And then mm -hmm. they'll say, We'll find Ray Ray. Where is he? Make it. It's a game. We'll make him go, through, and then they reward him by love, hugs, and kisses. So we'll do that a number of times, so the dog gets the idea that this is play, but it's also work. And then the next few times, I'll have a child go hide without Max seeing him. I'll hide his eyes and turn him around, and have the dog go find that child based on his nose, using his nose to find them. That's using scent trail. Um, and then when the dog can do that a number of times successfully, then we'll get have somebody go hide. We'll have somebody leave it like Friday morning at 8 a.m. and and walk a, a half a mile and uh, hide. And then I'll come in a couple hours later, give them the scent that they left behind. As usually it's a dirty sock or a dirty shoe. And then have the dog use his nose to go track them. And we just build this up over and over and over again until they pass a series of 58 tests. Once they've passed all their tests for tracking and trailing, 
Then we work what's called an air scent search where they have to use their nose into the wind to go find a person. And we use, it, we use that mostly for disaster work and dead body cases where the dog will work an area and tell me if the person's buried in there like in an avalanche or dirt, mud, debris, whatever, rock slide, uh, or it's a homicide case. Uh, the oldest case I have is was uh, I was in St. Croix teaching the police department and the fire department map and compass and search dog stuff. And my dog on her own just went into this old abandoned sugarcane field and started digging. And turned out it was an old slave grave back in the day when oh slave my gosh. Uh, she uncovered right. bones and clothing. And we, of course, froze the scene and called the police and they, they carbon dated the bones and said it was an old slave grave back in the day when the slaves died they, there was no ceremony they just buried them and went on with their work and that's what the search dog had found and it was oh, a, 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 she was buried in the late 1800s so oh uh, wow the oldest grave that i've ever found with a search dog it's uh, so amazing we, how smart these dogs are and well, how you well, could teach them we also you have to have so much patience yeah, <laughs> cemeteries and uh, we'll find a, a grave site where a person's been buried before the 1920. 1920 is when they first started using formaldehyde preservatives to preserve bodies. So anything before that is just a dead body buried in a grave. And we'll have the dogs sit on that and watch how they alert. So when they alert in the real search, the same way we know there's a body there. And mm -hmm. then for water, water training, we do the same thing. We'll take a plastic scent tube. It's called a PCV tube. We'll cap it on both ends. We'll put a human tooth in there wrapped in gauze. Or we'll put some human hair from a barber shop in there and put that, weight it down and put it in the water and then have the dog sniff along the trail or along the river or in a boat. And when they smell that human scent coming out of there, they identify it. We mark it. They have to be able to find three, three out of three in, in the water to pass their water test. And wow. that's how we do it. That's very interesting. That is, so how long of a period, or does it depend on what dog it is? Like, how long does it usually teach them? No, I mean, it take two years to train, fully train a search dog. Um, mm -hmm. I've had some dogs pick it up and, and qualify everything within nine months. And I've had others that took the full two years. So. That is awesome. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my God. One of the things I, I, love I, I used to work only one single dog by itself, but. Once I started working two dogs, I found it a little bit easier because one, you have the older dog teaching the younger dog. The younger dog falls to the older dog and learns from the older dog. So Aww. it's, and, and also um, when you have two dogs say the same thing, you know, you, yeah. it's hard to miss when two dogs say, hey, we're both giving death words. Sorry, there's somebody who fired off of fireworks. Uh, They're still doing fireworks. <laughs> We're at, we're in Longview. There's a bunch of inbreds here. Oh my gosh! Perfectly okay to scare the hell out of people and dogs. That is crazy. Yeah, Either that is a local gunshot. Maybe somebody just got shot. I don't know. Oh God. <laughs> um. So your dogs they stay with you, or you have them like in a kennel area, or? I don't know. My dogs sleep in my bed. Oh. There's no. I mean, they've outlasted four women. When it comes to <laughs> steps. Of course, you know, we're not. There's nothing <laughs> but my dogs sleep on the bed. Um, and then they live in the house and they go outside. They have a backyard. And, um, they go out. They get walks three times a day. They go to the dog park twice a day if we're not working. And oh, yeah. they, uh, they're my best friends, my partners, you know, in crime, so to speak. Uh, we're, we're very, very close because our lives depend on each other. They're not just yeah. pets. I mean, they, these are working dogs. Yeah. So fly inside the airplane. They fly right at my feet. They, they've been going to kennel. I've flown over 1,600 times with search dogs, and they just sit at my feet. Oh. When I'm on ski patrol, I don't do it anymore. But when I used to work ski patrol, uh, they'd go on a chair look with me, or up in a snowcat, um, in a helicopter. We just see both of them in the, the, the sweat ourselves, and away we go. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, they're they're pretty interesting little partners there. <laughs> um, I do have a. I don't know. You know Lita, right? The other 
admin in the group. I um, I don't know personally. Uh, um, I I have her on here. She's just listening. But uh, Lita, do you have any questions or? Oh, uh, Lita. <laughs> I think she we lost her. Maybe. Oh. Huh. Okay. Well. Um. Yeah. That's that's awesome. So they're basically like humans. They're your friends. They're your I like animals better than humans <laughs> anyway. So I would love having dogs around like around me like that. That's yeah. freaking awesome. Yeah, um, if anybody has any questions, they can, you know, email me directly and I'll be more than happy to answer the questions. Yeah, I was gonna tell you, do you want to um about your book? What is it? Do you wanna explain your book or um, oh, yeah two books out there. One's, the first one is called The Call to Duty. It's about search and rescue through the search dog's eyes through my search dog ranger. Mm -hmm. um, it's self-published and I've had thousands and thousands of people read it and love it. The second, It talks about the politics. It also talks a little bit about the Kyron Harmon case uh, as well as many other cases. And it talks about the politics and uh, about the Ashley Parr Miranda Gaddis case as well as the, uh, um, the cases in Klamath County. The second book is, uh, I, I developed that one for the help of, there's so much misinformation going out there, even amongst the search dogs. When I first started learning uh, how to use a search dog, I, we had an instructor come out from Rocky Mountain Rescue Dog Association in Utah and, and train us. Mm -hmm. And I was told back then you couldn't follow us in after three days. And we were getting calls from the sheriff's office where a person had been missing for over a month. And the search dogs would have no trouble picking up the scent and following it. And then we were also told that rain affected the search dogs. I found it, just the opposite, that rain actually helps liven the scent and liven the dog's capabilities of, of finding the scent. And we Why, that, is, cause it, why it, is that? The rain holds the scent close to the ground. It keeps the dog's nasal passages moist so they can absorb and taste the scent. And I've actually tracked somebody 18 months after they disappeared and found the remains. So, uh, mm -hmm. rain, rain actually has no effect on sand. Water actually helps us. It's the heat that it, it doesn't hurt us, but it doesn't help us. It dries out the dog's nose and it dries out the scent particles. And I mean, we worked in, when we worked in the Turkey earthquake, it was 110 degrees there. And the dog mm -hmm. had no trouble finding bodies, but live and dead. Um, mm -hmm. I worked in the Mojave Desert and Death Valley and um, cases and, and so it's just, uh, yeah, we can, and in the jungles in the Philippines as well as other places. Oh, um, wow. So you've just been everywhere. We did the earthquake in 1990 and the Philippine earthquake, and the, we've done uh, work in Haiti and Dominican Republic. And so, yeah, we've worked all over the place. Oh, wow. Well, I respect everything you do, and I don't um, appreciate when I see, you know, comments just bashing you for no reason. It's like well, the whole politic thing. You're going to get anytime, anytime you're a public person or a public person, you're going to get trolls. And they yeah. want identified. So they make all this fake crap up, you know, like, and we're not perfect. I mean, there's a case if I miss a person or a pet, they love to come out and go, oh, he's a fake, he's a fraud. And it's not, not the case. A lot of times they don't read the whole report. Um, yeah. We had a case not too long ago in St. Helens where a little puppy was missing. Uh, the, the owner had his own older dog, went out and looked for that puppy, cleared the property. The puppy was not on the property. So then he calls me and my dogs track it to the neighbors. The neighbor refuses to let us go on the property. Well, there's nothing I can do. Oh. So I told the, the owner who was with me during the track and said, I would you know, strongly urge you to pay attention to this. And we did, during that search, find some coyote poop with some fur in it. And I said, check this and see if this belongs to your dog. You know, because there are coyotes out there and they'll eat a puppy. And uh, he said, no, it wasn't. And that, that's where it was left. Well, then we get some troll out there who is just saying, well, Harry's a fake. Harry's a fraud. He didn't find this puppy. And he told the family that the dog was dead. Well, that's not, exact, not, that's not the truth. And of course, they just go with this because they, they think that's the partial truth, which is not. Mm. And you know, our reports are what protects us. Uh, the owner here 
of that puppy knows what happened because they were right there with us and they got a copy of my report. And anyway, then that puppy yeah. showed up the next day on the front porch, nice and clean, not dirty. So had it been out there the whole time, it would have been covered would have been. And, dirt and everything else. And it was nice and clean. So I think a certain person got a little nervous and let the puppy go and it came home. Because yeah. with his dog, we didn't find it with our dog. We tracked it to the neighbors and it stops. Hello. But anyway, <laughs> that, I get a lot of... I why would a neighbor try to... <laughs> oh my God. Why would I a neighbor try to steal their neighbor's dog? Well, it's I, like... So like, what are you going to do with it? You can't take it outside because everybody's going to see it. But <laughs> like, how well, stupid thing, are people? The thing is, is that there's a lot of people that may have a pot operation going or they may have a meth lab and they don't want us anywhere near that. You know, I could care, yeah. care, care less about the pot. If I find a mm -hmm. meth lab, yeah, I'm going to report it. But the pot, I don't yeah. That's their <laughs> Yeah, but oh, it's back in the day when the pot was illegal, it was hilarious. So we had a little lady on a in downtown Portland, who kept saying, "Stay away from my greenhouse." They were looking for her cat. I'm like, why <laughs> did you say that? And once she went to the bathroom, I opened up the greenhouse. There was twenty five huge pot plants down, you know, in, in her greenhouse. I'm not um, cars. I could care less, but I, I had to laugh, you know. Oh, you never know. <laughs> you never know. Oh my God! Did you end up finding? So yeah, the cat we, yeah, the cat was hiding over the neighbors underneath the deck. Mm -hmm. You know, and we get some hilarious calls. But I had some girl go off on me this morning that lives in the gorge. She was mad because I wouldn't drop everything I'm doing and come over. She had heard that somebody had murdered somebody and buried them in the basement of their house. Yet she wouldn't give me her name. I asked her to sign a contract because I can't legally go and do a search without a contract. And she wouldn't do that. And she yeah. kept telling me that the, the walls of the house were loaded with bees and that there's a grizzly bear living in the basement. The girl's not all there, you know. First of all, oh. a grizzly bear is not going to be living in somebody's basement. Let's just be honest here. And I'm not going to take my dogs anywhere near where a grizzly bear is going to be because I don't want a confrontation. I don't want to have to shoot the bear or mace it or get my dogs <laughs> killed or be killed. But anyway, she went off on me this morning big time telling me what I, who I was and fake and a fraud because I wouldn't drop everything and come out and look at this body and where the grizzly bear is. Well, why yeah. would you? She sounds like a nut from the beginning. Like, why would, <laughs> why would you um, drop everything to go... <laughs> Every full moon, uh, I get unsolicited emails and texts of, from everything from ET running around on their property. They want me to track ET to uh, my aunt just murdered her husband and, and he's buried in the garage. Uh, we get all sorts of wacky doodle crap. That's funny that you brought up ET because we had somebody months back say that an alien took Kyron and area he was in area 51 or something it was the weirdest if they wanted us to turn it in with for a tip and we were like okay no well, this know, is first off i do believe that we're not the only ones in this universe i'm not oh i do oh people. yeah i, I definitely but believe that run around and, and you know hover over skyline school and then <laughs> terry refused to take uh it just well, we're not going to go into all that, but the bottom line is, no, he mm -hmm. was did not take Kyron. No, he he definitely did not. But we we do get you know stuff like that all the time, and it's you know I can't imagine you've been doing your job for a long, long time, and this is like it's not even a job, but it's new for us doing this big group and dealing with all these people. So I can only imagine what you. Yeah, what we, you go through. We get all sorts of nut jobs. It's crazy. It's like distracting from what you're really trying to do well, and what you do do, you know? How do you how do you stop? How do you not react to the people that you have to realize why a person's contacting you? Are they doing it because they really care about the person that's missing? Mm -hmm. Are they doing it because they want that person found? Are they doing it because they're trying to cover up something? I had a police detective called me about many years ago. This guy disappeared uh, in his mid-40s in Tacoma. 
uh, on a Friday night riding his bike after a party. And his mother, who great, well, the, yeah, his mother, the, the man's mother, hired me on Sunday to go look for him. And she told the wife, his wife and son that she had hired me to come down and look or come up there and look for him. And the son immediately Googled me and then went in and talked to detectives face to face and confessed to murdering his father with his mother's help. And the reason she, he was confessing because he knew we were going to find the body that they buried him in a compost pile behind the house. And the detective, Holy this shit. is a Perry Mason case where somebody just gets, you know, come up and, and confesses everything before they even had to do anything based on my history of success. So that was an interesting case. Uh, the detective, like, you're not going to believe this, but this kid just came and confessed because you, you mentioned your name and did a Google search and said you were going to find his dad dead and knew that they were, he'd rather get it out in the open. And we've had a couple cases like that where people were just knew that we were coming to find their their loved one and that they had something to do with it and they they've confessed to the detective or to another family member what ha really happened um, that is insane i had mother claim that their children were missing and they ended up killing the, the child um i was in gresham city park i raised my son in gresham and i was in gresham city park walking my dog at the time and this lady came by in a stroller and my dog gave a death alert and I thought, that is the strangest thing I've ever seen. And then she walked right over to the, there's a mortuary right next to Gresham City Park. And she walked right over there. Well, later on, I found out the lady was a mental case and had killed her, her infant child and was running around with it in the, in the stroller. And then she went oh, to the mortuary my. asking them for help. Of course, they called Gresham PD and, and arrested her. But you, you just never. That is the, oh my gosh, that is freaking nuts. That yeah. is what. Ugh. Yeah, we get we get some real strange cases. I can't. I can't. I oh my god. I really applaud you because it's just that's really insane to me. <laughs> I I don't know how I deal with doing that all day every day. Um, dealing with these people are people you know and you have some really sane people and you have some really nice people Most yeah people i've met both in law enforcement as well in the civilian world are wonderful people and it's only like one or two percent that are just total whack jobs and the, the trolls and stuff and you just have to realize they're there yeah definitely they're always going to be there and i'm learning that now i kind of have to ignore it and let it just slide and not let them get any of my time because you yeah. know it's not worth it it's not yeah. it's not worth it we're trying to help a little boy you know bring awareness and at the oh. end of the day it's all good intentions nothing we're doing you know it, it, it's just I, I have to learn how to ignore it so <laughs> i'm like trying well, to learn from to take everything with a grain of salt like this lady from estacate has been on me for almost a month bad mouth of me to everybody that will listen and i finally turned her over to the federal prosecutor you know wait was that the one that i told you i the email or yeah okay okay I, finally did, I, I kept asking her to provide me with some kind of documentation to support her statements and she refused to do that. I asked her for her email. She refused to give me that. I finally found out where she worked. I contacted her at work and said, knock it off. Mm -hmm. And she said, how dare you contact me at work? Well, what do you think she's doing with me? I, this is my my office. This is my work. Yet she has no problem bad mouthing me publicly, making yeah. statements at my work and to everybody that I work with. And so I finally went to the federal prosecutor and said, I want this lady uh, taken care of legally um, because she's violent, she's harassing me using the internet capabilities uh, uh, communication to yeah. and annoy me and making false statements. So they, they they're taking. Are they of working? Me. Are they working uh, on it? I can tell you if it's been taken care of. I'm glad. So I'm really glad. We you know, of course we uh blocked her on facebook and on our my facebook and she can say what she wants but again it comes down to in 50 years of doing this if i was a fake a fraud or a scam artist i would have been shut down many years ago you know see all these mm -hmm. people say, well, you're a fraud you're a scammer like well provide me with some one piece of dog one piece 
of documentation to support your statement. Had a yeah. Hold up, hold up in court because I'm an expert witness in the courtroom when it comes to search dogs, scent, scent evidence, missing persons. I've been called to testify in cases in Virginia, all over the United States, and my credibility holds up in the courtroom. And that's where it mm -hmm. counts, not on public mm -hmm. media. It's a, exactly. It's a, they're they're going to check everything I say and do to make validate that I'm I am who I am. Yeah. I've done what I've said I've done, and so one of the nice things about the audit for the DOJ is they went through every file I had, and that's they validated good. everything that I said and didn't. Said, yeah, what he said he did, he did. That's really good. I'm yeah. glad that they did that. So I you know too. you can. Me too. You know you can get your name cleared in that kind well, of you know people will still talk, but it's. But it proves, you know, you're not a fraud. You're, you're not a team. Exactly. You know, everybody gets a contract, so they, they, they're protected. They know exactly what's going, what, you know, they're going to be charged, what's going to happen, what kind of search is going to be done. Mm -hmm. And they come along with us. We show them what we find. And uh, we write a report. We show we get We give them copies of our report. We give them copies of the photographs of the evidence we find. Yeah. And, oh, I mean, it, it stood up in the courtroom so many times. There's just no question. Exactly. Well, I, um, oh wait, I have one more question. Um, I forgot what it was. <laughs> well, if you have. You're questions. the only person I've never been nervous on a show oh. and I'm like, oh my God, what, why am I so nervous questions. right now? Write them down. Send me an email. I'll be more than happy to answer. Yeah, I'll do that. And then also Ooh. on this video, um, when we get done, you know, editing and all that. Uh, well, we're not editing. We're going to add it onto another live yeah. video that we're doing. But I'll add your email on there if that's okay. And then the book thing. And people can email you with questions they sure. have. Um, I'm, I'm glad that you're able to speak openly about sure. everything. Um, I'm glad you get to tell your side of the story and we really appreciate it. Um, Lita, do you have anything to say? I don't know if you're on mute. Did you mute yourself? I lost her. I don't, I don't see her on there. So. I see her name. I see her name, but I... Lita? She's not on there. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. like I said, I'm gonna get going here because I, I do have to go do a search in that area here. So, um, why don't you, uh, if you have any questions, just feel free to email me or feel free to okay. email. I will. Uh, I appreciate you taking your time out to um, do welcome. this. Thanks for uh, trying to help Kyron and anybody else. Thank you, and I will talk to you later. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.